No other king could vanquish the war horse or silence the warrior's rage while riding the lowly back of a donkey. No other king could break the dominion of darkness, the tyranny of evil, with a reign of grace and a kingdom of peace. No other king could give his life for the redemption of rebels, his wealth to welcome the outcast. Jesus is that king, the king of glory, son of the living God. Not just another king, not just another prophet, not just another teacher. He was the one the world had been waiting for. The one to deliver us from captivity, the son of David and Abraham's chosen seed. He is the goal of the Mosaic law, Yahweh in the flesh. He is the one to establish God's reign and rule, to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim good news to the poor. This Jesus was the creator come to earth and the beginning of a new creation. He embodied the covenant, fulfilled the commandments, and reversed the curse. This Jesus is the Christ that God spoke of to the serpent, the one prefigured to Noah in the flood, the one promised to Abraham, the one guaranteed to Moses before he died, the one promised to David during his reign, the one revealed to Isaiah as a suffering servant, the one predicted through the prophets and prepared for through John the Baptist. He is the Father's Son, Savior of the world, and substitute for our sins. More loving, more holy, and more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. He is our Jesus, and there is no other king like him. He is our God, our glory, our victorious Savior. There is no other king like him. There is no other king. If you have a Bible, I'm going to be in Luke chapter 23. If you've ever read through the Gospels and come to the crucifixion, in all of the accounts that are laid out, there's something that is, is a tension, at least for me as I read it, and that is that, that Jesus never, never really speaks. He doesn't say that much. Uh, I imagine that if I had found myself in a similar position, I would have been very quick to defend myself. I would have been very quick to scream as loud as I could. I would have been very quick to exert any power that I had to stop this injustice. And yet Jesus, with every punch, with every kick, with every spit, with every mocking, with every scourge, with every nail, says nothing. In fact, Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7 says that he was oppressed and he was afflicted but he did not open his mouth. He was like a lamb that was led to slaughter and like a sheep that before his shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. If you can picture the experience that Jesus would have gone through and you can picture the dedication to suffering that it would have taken for Jesus, who could have very easily just with a flick of his finger or a syllable out of his mouth or a thought that went through his head stopped all of it and yet he remains committed to getting to the cross. By the time he gets there, he is, uh, he is, there's not much left of him. He's been beaten. He's been scourged with a cat of nine tails. He's been punched and kicked. He's been struck with rods. He's had a crown of thorns jammed into his head. He is traumatized in every possible way. He's laid down on a piece of wood that would have gone up onto a scaffolding and nails are driven probably through his wrists. His feet are laid on top of one another and a nail is driven through and he's hung up there to die. Crucifixion uh, is a brutal death by any definition and the Romans had perfected it. I want you to imagine uh, what it would have looked like to have been there. What it would have looked like the sounds, the smells, what it would have been in front of you, and Jesus is hanging there for about an hour, and in the first hour, Jesus goes out of his way to make three statements. 
the first two statements that he makes in the third hour of the day, probably about 9 a.m. He's been hanging there somewhere between 15 minutes and 45 minutes, and, and he makes a prayer to the Father. In Luke chapter 23, verses 33 and 34, he says this, And when they came to the place that was called the skull, they crucified him with criminals on the right hand and on the left. And Jesus said, <laughs> Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they are doing, and they cast lots to divide his garments. He doesn't speak to stop it. He doesn't speak to rebut the injustice. He doesn't speak to contradict. He doesn't speak to argue. But when nails are in his wrists and a nail is through his feet, he does speak to ask the Father to forgive those who are murdering him, to forgive those who have lied about him, to forgive those who have punched him, kicked him, spat on him, lied about him. He does muster up the strength, push himself up so that he can get oxygen into his lungs so those words can come out of his mouth. Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. The second statement in the first hour is, is similar. Jesus is hanging between two criminals, individuals who deserve to die, individuals who their behavior or their motivation, their testimony led them to the cross, very dissimilar to Jesus. They know that they're supposed to be there. <clears throat> and along the way, one of the criminals begins to jump in on the mocking and jump in on the arguing and jump in on the blasphemy. And the other one begins to notice that Jesus is offering forgiveness instead of anger, that Jesus is quiet, that Jesus appears to be dying differently, and he identifies him for who Jesus had claimed to be, the Messiah, the one who could forgive. And he said, hey, man, if you are who you say that you are, can you take me where you're going when we're done with this? And Jesus, a second time, says, the criminal says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, if it's me, not only do I say something on the front end when I have the chance and the capability of stopping it, but when I'm on the cross, I'm not worried about your forgiveness, and I'm not worried about where you're going after you're dead. And yet Jesus, who doesn't speak when it could have profited him, does speak to offer forgiveness to his accusers, his attackers, his blasphemers, his murderers, and to a criminal who asked, could you take me wherever you're going? The third thing that Jesus says in that first hour is in John chapter 19 verses 26 through 27 and Jesus saw his mother and the disciple who he loved that being John standing nearby and he said to his mother woman behold your son and then he said to the disciple behold your mother and from that hour the disciple took her to his own home and so I just want you to picture what you would have been seeing I want you to picture what you would have been hearing I want you to picture what you would have been smelling. I want you to picture the humidity and the dirt and the blood and the silence until Jesus decides to speak and his statements are of forgiveness and family. Who do you know that dying that way is thinking of someone else? Who do you know that dying that unjustly, that brutally, that violently, that historically is worrying about what's going to happen to his mom and where the criminal is going to spend eternity? It begins to give you some insight into who this man was and what his motivation is and why he is unique among all other human beings. And so in that first hour, Jesus says three things, and then for five hours, he's completely silent. Now, if you think about this logically, you can understand typically whenever we experience pain, we go inward, right? We, th we close our eyes, we clench our muscles, we, we try to cope in silence. And certainly, there's an element of Jesus' silence that has to do with the physical trauma that he was experiencing. I don't want to be gratu gratuitous about this, but I think that it's important for us to remember that Jesus was a carpenter. Jesus wasn't a killer. Jesus wasn't trained as a fighter. Jesus is taken into what would have been the equivalent of a church, and the church leaders put him on trial, and when they deem that he is a liar, they begin to slap him and punch him, and as he falls to the ground, they begin to kick him and spit on him. 
This is before he even makes it to Rome and Pilate. I don't know if you've ever found yourself in a position where you are being helplessly kicked and punched, but Jesus did that night. And so Jesus would have gotten to Pilate, and he would have been probably bloodied and bruised. He probably would have been concussed. He probably would have had different bodily fluids coming out of his body. And he stands before Pilate, and Pilate begins to interrogate him, and Jesus will not interact necessarily in the way that Pilate says. And so Pilate puts him in front of the Jewish people and says, why don't we just call an end to this. I'll give you a real criminal, and this guy can go home. And they say, no, we want, we want Jesus. And so Pilate takes him out, and he tells these Roman soldiers who were trained killers, who were trained assassins and hitmen and soldiers, to soften them up, so to speak. And so what they did is they would have taken rods, and they would have on this man who had already been beat up imperfectly by church leaders, these trained killers would have taken rods and they would have began to hit him as hard as they possibly could could at whatever part of his body that was exposed. And after they did that, they stripped him down. And so remember, he's bloodied and he's beaten and he has welts and he probably has all kinds of different visible trauma to him. And they would have tied his hands above his head and they would have pulled out what's called a cat of nine tails, essentially a leather whip at the end of it being glass and shards of uh, rock, and they would, have, they would have whipped him. The Jews had a law that you weren't allowed to whip somebody more than 39 times. It was presumed that 40 times would kill a man. The Romans did not have that law. And so by the time they were done, on top of what had already been done to Jesus, it's very likely that you could have seen at pieces through him but that wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. And so they put a robe on him, and they put a crown of thorns onto his head, and they jam it down, and he's now bleeding on every square inch of his body. They bow down before him. They mockingly worship him. He's experiencing unbelievable trauma at this point. He's taken to a cross, very large nails. These aren't roofing nails. These are nails that are probably about that long and about a quarter in diameter, and they're driven through the base of his hands. His feet are laid on top of one another, and a nail is sent through them. And so Jesus is in five hours of silence, logically just experiencing trauma and trying to cope. But I think that it was more than that. I think that his silence is not only physical trauma. In the ninth hour, about 3 p.m., Jesus has been on the cross six hours at this point. And just to let you know what's happening in his body at this point, the trauma was intended to soften him up so that he didn't have the strength to stand up, to push himself up, so that he could give above his bodily fluid and experience oxygen coursing through his veins. And so he is effectively suffocating at this point. He is traumatized in every possible way. And in the ninth hour, he makes another statement about the ninth hour, Jesus cried, with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? This statement is not because Jesus doesn't know. Many times throughout the Gospels, Jesus makes statements to the Father that are intended for his hearers, and this is no different. Jesus is letting us know the consequence of what's happening to him. He's letting us know the magnitude of sin. Whenever you think about sin, whenever I think about sin, I tend to think about it only on the surface. I tend to think about the sins that I know, the sins that I've done, the sins that I can remember. I don't think about your sin as much as I think about my sin, let alone the totality of the sin that's created by this room. So I just want you to think for a minute about sin, every intended sin. You know the ones that you know are wrong but you still do? and every unintended sin. The things that you didn't know you should do, so you don't do them. The things that you didn't mean to do, the consequences and effect that you didn't mean to have. Everything that is done and everything that should have been done. Every known sin. You have sins that are public and that are known to you and every private sin, the ones that you would be the most embarrassed by, the ones that you hope nobody ever finds out about. And not only initial sin, but the responses to sin, the chain effect that's created by sin, you know, the kind that is, I wouldn't have done that if you hadn't that sin. And the effect of that on a relationship and the damage of that on a family 
and the damage of that family on a community and on a church and on a city and on a region and on a nation times the world. Every single sin, every desire, every thought, every motive, every word, every action is the magnitude of sin. And I started to just think about our church and how much that probably is. And, and then I started to think, you know, I wonder just how much that would be for the 7.6 billion people that are living in the world right now. And then I started to think, I wonder maybe in the last 20 years. And then I started to think, you know, I wonder the amount of people that have been born onto the planet Earth because we know that Jesus didn't just die for the sins that had been and the sins that were, but the sins that would come. And so I started to do some research and I found out that up until 2017, 108 billion people had been born on the planet Earth. 108 billion people. It's really hard to quantify that, so let me do my best. If you were to fly 108 billion miles, you would fly around the world 4.337 million times. Or you would go to the moon and back 226,036 times. That's what 108 billion looks like. If you lived for 108 billion minutes, you would live until you were 205,479 years old. Please understand that I'm not talking about 108 billion sins. I'm talking about 108 billion sinners. Sin machines, sin factories. Calvin called the human heart an idol factory. I'm talking about that if you could quantify all of your sins, don't worry about your spouse's sins, your kids' sins, my sins, their sins, your own sins. If you could try to put a number on that and understand that every single one of those, the ones that you know to count and the ones that you don't know to count, were put on top of Jesus. And then quantify that times 108 billion. And you can see why Jesus might have been silent. You can see why whenever Matthew comes to him and says, hey, whenever you get to the kingdom, can you give me a, a good seat at the table? And Jesus says, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Are you able to do what I'm about to do? You see, the reason that Jesus is sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, I believe, isn't necessarily because of the physical pain. I think that Jesus was very clear about it. Jesus knew exactly what he was about to experience. But I think the thing that he feared wasn't the nails. It was the 108 billion. And I need you to understand that the longer that Jesus tarries, we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, let it be any day. But the longer that Jesus waits to come back, the higher the price of sin he paid. Most statisticians say by 2050, that number will be 113 billion. All of those sins, all of those lives, all of those desires, all of those motivations, all of those words, all of those actions aimed at one man. You see why in Matthew 26 and verse 39, he said, my father, if it's possible, let this cup, let it pass from me, man. Nevertheless, when you quantify it, you, you see the amount of submission. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. I understand where I'm going. I understand what's happening. I understand the price tag. I understand the 108 billion or the 113 billion or the 120. I understand the necessity and the weight of this. And I don't necessarily want to go, but if you say this is the only way, then I'll go and I'll experience that physical trauma, but more than that, I'll experience the trauma that sin affects. You think about sin in your own life. You think about the damage of sin on your own soul. You think about the damage of sin on your own body. You think about the damage of your choices on yourself and understand that Jesus took all of those times, it feels like infinity. And Jesus goes to the cross, and Jesus experiences the trauma, and Jesus goes to pay that price. How can this be good? I was reading through, we live in this day where when we don't understand it, we tend to not like it. And I was looking at all the different things that people are saying we should rename Good Friday. We should call it God Friday, or we should call it Cross Friday, or we should call it... And it 
it fails to understand the point. Our faith is tied to Good Friday because our God was willing to do that to make it good for us. And to rename it is to fail to understand his intent, his motivation, his desire. The book of Hebrews says that he was willing to endure it, listen, for the joy that was set before him. What was that joy? That was you, and that was me, and that was us, and it was what we would be together, and it was who God says that we are, and it was the restoration and the redemption and the resurrection that's happened in so many of your lives that would bring you out on this Good Friday to remember and observe this. That's what makes it good. He's what makes it good. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 makes this statement, for our sake he, that being God the Father, made him to be sin who knew no sin. Remember, to be sin of 108 billion today sinners, he made him to be it. Not to do it, not to feel the effects of it, but he made him a target a point of response, a point of action for the holiness of God. And God responded to him as he must respond to sin. Whenever John chapter 1 talks about us seeing the glory of God full of grace and truth, the clearest picture of that is on the cross because the truth of God had to deal with the sin that Jesus became. The holiness of God, the justice of God, Whenever you start to wonder why does God let bad things happen to good people and vice versa, look at the cross. He made him to be no sin. He deals with sin. He dealt with sin, and he does two things. The first is that he abandons his boy. This is why Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is entirely alone on the cross for the first and only time in eternity. The only time in all eternity that Jesus is separated from his father, separated from his Holy Spirit, that he is entirely isolated and alone, is on the cross with the weight of 108 billion sinners on his head. And God sees him for who he is, for who we made him, and says, son, I love you, but I have to turn my back on you. And Jesus is alone to pay that penalty by himself. The second thing that God the Father does is he pours out his wrath. The Bible talks many different times about the cup of wrath. We don't like to talk about, we don't like to think about the wrath of God, but let me ask you to look at it as intently as you can. Can you imagine, can you imagine the wrath of a holy God on the sins of 108 billion sinners? I'm talking about murderers, I'm talking about rapists, I'm talking about child molesters, I'm talking about all of the very worst that you can possibly think times history. I'm talking about that we tend to think that there are certain people that deserve to get whatever they get wherever they get it. All of those times, all of history, are put on one man's head and a holy, infinitely powerful God unleashes on him. All of the things that should be done, all of the things that must be done, the holiness of God's entire wrath against all sin for all time in all places is directed at one man. And he obliterates his boy. The wrath of God is what put Jesus into the tomb. The weight of sin put Jesus into death some theologians think that he went to hell to take the keys. Some think that he didn't. It misses the point. Jesus dies under the weight and penalty. The wages of sin are death, and God takes all of the wages of all of humanity ever earned in all time and all place across every tongue, tribe, and nation and points them at his son. Why would he do this? 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 says, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is why this is Good Friday. 
It obviously isn't Good Friday to Jesus. It obviously isn't Good Friday to the Father. It obviously isn't a good day by any way, shape, or form. But Christianity is unique in this regard. Our faith is tied to one man and one day. Christianity is unique in the pantheon of religions. Most religions think about a sweep of time and a series of events. We don't. We look to one man on one day who did one thing that seems horrific to the logical sane mind but is good in its redemptive effect in resurrecting sinful man. And so we come into rooms, and as we prepare our heart for the gladness and the celebration of resurrection, we balance it out by the weight of the price that was paid to make that resurrection necessary. And the way that God has told us to proclaim this is to take communion, to proclaim the goodness of Jesus until he comes, to remind ourselves of the way of sin until he comes, to never fail to get too far away from Good Friday in your mind, in your faith, in our churches, in our hearts until he comes. And so we want to make this as simple as we can on Good Friday. I want you in this next song that we're going to sing to come down. I'd like you to get the elements, and I'd like you to go back to your seat. And as we sing to God, as we sing praises to God, I'd like you to just consider what makes Good Friday good. I'd like you to consider 2 Corinthians 5. I'd like you to consider 108 billion sinners. I'd like you to consider your own sin and your own failings, and your own pieces that made the cross necessary. And I'd like you to maybe take communion like you've never taken it before. So I'm going to have you stand up. I'm going to pray.